says he, quote, found throughout scripture at least 75 examples of things that the New Age has counterfeited, such as having a spirit guide, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and more. These actually belong to the church, he says, but have been stolen and cleverly repackaged. Now, whenever you see a counterfeit, I hope you'll ask yourself, what is that a counterfeit of? What is its source? How can I have the authentic? Twisting scripture to accommodate a lie is common practice with occultists and is, of course, what Satan did when he tried to tempt Jesus Christ after his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Jesus Christ responded with the authority of the Spirit of Truth, a crucial concept for Bible-believing Christians today who want to be discerning and fend off lying spirits. I thought that the lying spirits were good, and anyone that came against the lies were bad, because we were taught that. We were taught that any, if anyone came against <coughs> our belief system, they had a religious spirit, and that they were bad. They just didn't know. They didn't know the new thing. They were stuck. They had God in a box, and this is what we were taught, that this whole movement was to get God out of the box that Christians had always kept God in a box and they didn't allow him to do all these new things that he was capable of. So we had opened this box <laughs> and let God out and he was doing all these new things. <laughs> One of the things that has been most heartbreaking is watching well-meaning Christians who are prominent in the Christian world, whether they are pastors or like Todd Bentley, an evangelist out of the New Apostolic Reformation, is that they are assuming now a place of openness in which another spirit is coming and working through them, if you will, channeling through them, and producing manifestations that have nothing to do with anything you see anywhere in Scripture, Old or New Testament, except with the demonized. Thinking they are hearing the voice of God, what they're doing is channeling angels of light <coughs> who are demons masquerading as the Spirit of God. The teachings they are given are contrary to Scripture and the manifestations are a display of blasphemous buffoonery that can only be described to the demonic. And yet they're assuming they are channeling God. And in fact, one pastor actually said to me, we have become channels for God. Mike Bickle, for all of his new signs and wonders and all of the Holy Spirit and the charismatic things, he's also dabbling very, very heavily in Eastern mysticism and Middle Age mysticism found in Catholicism. So that merger that's going on with him and what he's promoting through IHOP and the university and his own teachings are merging the new charismatic with the very old ritualistic, mystical practices of the Middle Ages. Even looking at the books that he recommends through his website or the bookstore at, uh, at IHOP, you'll find selections from uh, Teresa of Avila. You'll find Richard Foster in the Celebration of Discipline, which is very ancient mysticism through Catholicism and even Eastern meditative thought. Prophet Mike Bickle, founder of the Kansas City Fellowship and the International House of Prayer Movement, is considered by many to be mainstream. His revelation from supposedly God received in Egypt mandating him to change the understanding and expression of Christianity is coming to fruition through his IHOP University and IHOP bookstore which promotes Roman Catholic mysticism and New Age Gnosticism to millions. A new understanding and expression of Christianity is certainly being ushered in but tragically, it is feeding into a new world order and religion. Bickle's Kansas City Fellowship initially drew many together who believed that they had prophetic giftings from the Holy Spirit and became known as the Kansas City Prophets. After linking with John Wimber, mystical manifestations became commonplace in what was called the Metro Vineyard in Kansas City. Today, the NAR movement has morphed into a hotbed for teachings about mysticism. Prophet 
James Gall, for instance, an advocate of Seven Mountain theology and the release of powers for dominionism, who, by the way, rejects the rapture teaching because it opposes the staying behind to take dominion of the earth for the second coming of Jesus, is a member of the Harvest International Ministries Apostolic Team, director of Prayer Storm, and author of the book Dream Language, available in Mike Bickle's IHOP bookstore. The product description says, after centuries of neglect, the church is rediscovering the realm of dreams and visions as a legitimate avenue for receiving divine revelation. Such thinking shows James Gall to be a mystic who admits he gets mystical revelation through what he calls downpourings from the Holy Spirit. One downpouring, he claims, promoted a third great awakening, the greatest youth awakening in the world. He has written numerous books about societal transformation and revival through the use of occult practices such as angelic encounters, visitations to heaven, extra-biblical revelations through visions and dreams, and what is termed as the shifting of a mindset to unleash the prophetic. who writes in his study guide on consecrated contemplative prayer, I wish to express thanks to our Lord for the writings of Richard Foster. Richard Foster popularized Roman Catholic rituals that seek transformation by entering altered states of consciousness and call his discipline spiritual formation. By the 1980s, the spiritual formation movement that is a channel for contemplative prayer flooded into evangelical denominations and is today rampant within the NAR movement. Its foundational claim is to bring Christians into a deeper connection with God. However, rather than furthering the biblical method to teach the Word of God, spiritual formation teaches mystical experiences through spirit encounters and ecstasies in a process called getting into the presence. Eastern mysticism teaches one must go within to find God, but the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Obviously, venturing inwards for the presence of God is not biblical. It is easy to see how evangelical and Pentecostal Christians tend towards Roman Catholic mystics like St. Teresa of Avila from Spain whose name, incidentally, I took as my confirmation name when I was seven years old for my first Holy Communion ceremony while still a practicing Roman Catholic. Teresa claims she rose from the lowest stage of recollection while doing her devotionals of silence to the highest stages, joining in perfect union with God during her devotions of ecstasy, which were accompanied by rich experiences in the blessings of tears. Such mystical expressions occur during Hindu serpent power awakenings, but it's more digestible for Christians to label such ecstasies as coming from the presence of Jesus Christ rather than give the credit to the snake. Roman Catholic priest Thomas Keating said of Kundalini, in Christian spirituality, the unfolding of the stages of prayer described by St. Teresa of Avila in the interior castle may be the fruit of the kundalini energy arising under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I know what it's like to have ecstatic, magnificent, beautiful, uplifting experiences that even as you're reading the Word of God suddenly you're saying, oh God, I want to be in your presence, and you feel yourself taken up. And suddenly you think you're in the third heaven, face to face with God, and having an encounter with beings that are ecstatic in the experiences they're producing, and glorious in their manifestation. And I was convinced that these experiences were from God. Why? Because my only means of testing it was my subjective experience. It felt so different from all the frightening evil 
things that I encountered as a young woman and as a child. The feeling was so different. It was producing good fruit. I was no longer as afraid or as terrified as I used to be. I would invoke this Jesus in my special place of silence, my psychic laboratory, that is identical to the place of silence of the emerging church and the contemplative movement. And I would simply weave this white light of Jesus, of the Christ around me, and I knew I was safe. This glorious experience of this Jesus within me was slowly shifting my understanding of who Jesus was to a cosmic Jesus, a Jesus who accepted everyone and everything. I had another Jesus who was teaching me another gospel and was being very compliant in giving me manifestations from another spirit. That's exactly what I see happening in the Pentecostal Church, the New Apostolic Reformation, the latter reign, the manifested sons of God, all branches of radical Pentecostalism that's moved into Dominionism. They think they're contacting Jesus, but they're contacting an angel of light. In the early 90s, when we saw the Holy Laughter, it was a brand new thing. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. It was seen as so extreme, it was charismatic, and it was really enthralling to the people that were watching it. Interestingly enough, though, it has become very, very run-of-the-mill now. The problem with the pursuit of mysteries, the pursuit of signs, the pursuit of wonders, it has the same effect of people who take drugs. Whatever is working great now is not going to work so great tomorrow, so you go to the next strongest thing that you can find. If you would have said back in the 90s during the holy laughter that down the road people are going to talk about teleporting, they're going to talk about people who will levitate, wind up in two different places halfway across the globe, being caught up into the heavens, being raptured, and having throne room experiences, they would have been laughed at. Now people are paying money to hear people speak about these things and help to initiate them into such practices. The pursuit of mysticism really has no end, as we're seeing now. Whatever was strong today is just run-of-the-mill tomorrow. In our English language, we have a word bait. What it basically is, you can put it on a fish hook, you can put it in a trap of any kind, but it's supposed to lure in the person with something that they want, something they can see, or something that they can taste to them that is tangible. What we have is an entire generation of these new prophets, new apostles, laying out bait for people all over the place. Something that is appealing to them. Nothing that would warn the people that what they're about to ingest or about to take could lead to their ultimate peril. The people that are baiting the trap are just as deceived as the people that are eating the bait because it's the devil who sprung the trap. John G. Lake are two of the most influential names who exert tremendous influence in today's new apostolic and prophetic movements. William Brannan believed in the manifest sons of God doctrine, claiming he was God manifested in the flesh, which became the main heresy of the latter rain movement. In contrast to mysticism, the Bible teaches man is not equal to God nor is the church equal to God or any person in it. 
Only Jesus Christ is God, and he is the only begotten Son of God. John G. Lake, born in 1870, who died in 1935, was an early Dominion teacher and taught the unbiblical concept that we are gods. Yet Mike Bickle of the International House of Prayer said Lake influenced him more than any man other than Jesus. IHOP promotes John G. Lake's complete works and the NAR movement furthers Lake's concept of the importance of healing rooms to receive healing and daily prayer. Healing rooms are an integral part of NAR discipline, yet not the method Jesus used for healing. His healings were instant through an audible command or physical touch, not through the establishing of rooms for prayer day after day. The idea of man becoming God is held by many cults. For instance, Mormonism, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, teaches mankind has the potential of becoming gods. Interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church also teaches that man can become God. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says, The Word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. For this is why the Word became man, and the Son of God became the Son of man so that man, by entering into communion with the Word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a son of God. For the Son of God became man, so that we might become God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he, made man, might make men gods. Madame Guyon, a French mystic born in 1648, was a key advocate of quietism, surprisingly considered heretical by the Roman Catholic Church because it promoted the idea of the possibility of achieving a sinless state and union with the Christian Godhead. This seems confusing when compared to Catholic catechism stating Jesus assumed our nature so that he might make men gods. Yet Madame Guyon, achieving union with the Godhead, was proclaimed heresy. <coughs> Today, mystical union with God is part of the paradigm shift taking humanity into the awareness of God in all and God in everyone, a theology necessary for Antichrist to set up his one world religion. Contradictions prevail like weeds in the teachings of mysticism, Guruism teaches Guru is greater than God, begging the question, how can anything be greater or higher than the Most High God? Yet in character with the contradictory doctrines of demons, the unholy spirit of Satan assumes he will be like the Most High. In Isaiah 14 he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. In this prideful attitude of arrogance, not only Satan blasphemes the Holy Spirit by assuming himself to be like the Most High, but all involved in mysticism continue the blasphemy. The role of Guru as the dispeller of darkness, in Sanskrit, Gu is darkness and Ru is light, is equated to the work of Jesus Christ with his disciple on the one hand and the union of Jesus Christ with his Father on the other. Paramahansa Yogananda explains, To regain one's divinity, one must have such a master or guru. He who faithfully follows a true guru becomes like him, for the guru helps to elevate the disciple to his own level of realization. The guru-discipleship relationship is the loftiest and most sacred of all relationships. Christ and his disciples were all one in spirit, as are my master, Swami Sri Yukteswa, and those who are in tune with me. The idea of Jesus Christ being one with his Father was certainly mentioned in Jesus' prayer before he went to the cross. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. But the difference between Jesus' prayer and Pramahansa's mystical philosophy are huge. We are not all partakers in some kind of universal cosmic mystical union. 
only Jesus can dispel darkness, as only Jesus is the light. Only he resurrected from the grave and was seen by hundreds for over 40 days between Passover and the Feast of the First Fruits. Only Jesus is able to give his Holy Spirit to those who repent of their sin and accept him as the promised Messiah. Only his Spirit at that point of rebirth reconciles the new creature in Christ to eternal life with God his Father. This is the miraculous unity, the promise of eternal life over the judgment of eternal separation due to the wages of sin being death. All union with the spirit world beyond the message of Jesus Christ and the cross is occultism. Madame Guyot's mysticism is what Prophet Mike Bickle recommends all his students at IHOP must read in fact, he says he himself had a three-month period when he read nothing but Madame Guyon and John G. Lake. Guyon promoted contemplation over biblical meditation, intellectual stillness, interior passivity, and spiritual discipline for ecstatic union with God. These and other types of occult practices are taught in classes at IHOP University. Mike Bickle has become very radical in his attachment to Roman Catholic mystics and contemplative prayer. His IHOP bookstore makes available the works of Roman Catholic priest Thomas Keating, co-founder along with Basil Pennington, also promoted at IHOP, of the Centering Prayer Movement and of contemplative mystical theology, intent on uniting Protestants and Roman Catholics worldwide. IHOP also promotes the reading of various Trappist monks, and Bickle says of Fire Within by Roman Catholic mystic Thomas Dubay, I want this book to be the manual of International House of Prayer, Kansas City. Another book being offered through IHOP is The Forgotten Desert Mothers by Laura Swan, who writes, we begin to discard our old ways and go in search of new ways of communicating with God. Our prayer matures and takes on new forms. And what are these forms? Swan states, centering prayer, Lectio Divina, Latin for divine reading, a traditional Roman Catholic Benedictine contemplation, Thais worship, a contemplative practice of silence with icons, candles, incense and prayer stations, and another type of Roman Catholic duty called divine office the reciting of certain prayers at fixed hours of the days and night. E.W. Kenyon is another teacher of heresy promoted by the NAR movement. Born in 1867, he died in 1948 and heavily promoted divine healing, saying it was always God's will to be healed. Known as the father of the Word of Faith movement, E.W. Kenyon introduced many New Age ideas and Christianized occultism to the church, which got revived some years later in the teachings of Word Faith promoter Kenneth Hagen, who died in 2003. Hagen taught, It's not God's will for any to be sick. Flying in the face of the reality of death and sickness, hypercharismatic, New Agey, name it and claim it, health and wealth teachings continue to be foundational in NAR's decrees of occult, demanding, commanding, affirming, and declaring, which dovetail with word faith positive confession prosperity gospel promoter Kenneth Copeland, who claims we are little gods, a sentiment completely compatible with Hindu mysticism that teaches we are divinity, as does Roman Catholicism. The mystical undergirding of all religions is certainly a prerequisite for the coming together of a global spirituality. When we look at this doctrine of being little gods, uh, and we examine the, the uh, writings of Mike Bickle from the IHOP movement, uh, his, his influence in the church and in the uh, new apostolic reformation and modern charismatic movements is, is profound. He mentions John G. Lake, who was uh, a healing evangelist during the late 1800s into the early 1900s. The level of influence that this man had upon Mike Bickle, and I'll read this quote. I went on an extended fast in the summer of 1981, and I ran into two things that changed my life. 
I ran into the teachings of a man whom I read for some weeks during that fast. His name is John G. Lake. His writings totally transformed my life. Of course, this is the same John G. Lake who believes that we're little gods. He believes that we are God incarnate. Here's one of the quotes that goes to the heart of what he believed. I want you to hear what Jesus said about himself. God was in Christ, wasn't he? An incarnation. God is in you, an incarnation. If you were born again, you are incarnate. So if we connect those dots from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, to the latter rain movement, even to Mike Bickle and his promotion of John G. Lake, running throughout is this belief that we are little gods. When we talk about incarnation, and it is mentioned in the New Apostolic Reformation, they look at the writings of E.W. Kenyon, and he popularized what they call kenosis. That's actually a Greek word. It means emptying. It's taken from Philippians chapter 2, where Paul tells us to let this mind be in you that was in Christ, that he as they would say, he laid aside. What he did is he emptied himself. That's the Greek word where it says he made himself of no reputation. Okay, so that was the emptying of himself. So they see that we can be kind of in the same place as that. When he, Jesus, speaks to God the Father in his priestly prayer in chapter 17 of the book of John, we see in verse 5 he says, Father, now glorify me with the glory that we shared before the world was. They would look at that and say, he was in some place lessened and he made himself something less than what he was. They think that we can attain to that. That's the underlying belief through being little gods, as though Jesus became a little god while he dwelt among us. We were taught to um, that we were God, that we were to be God here on earth, that God was in us, and that we were do, to do the things that God was doing. Personally, for myself, I never believed that I was God, um, but people that I was around believed that they were they were God and, and took on that appearance that they were better, bigger than other people. That teaching itself is absolutely unbiblical because if Jesus was to have become something less, some lesser form of God, he would be running completely contrary to Isaiah 42, 8, where God says, I'm the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I give to none other. I don't share my glory with anyone. And when Jesus is able to say in John chapter 15, glorify me with the glory that we shared before the world was, he never left his deity. He simply confined himself to a body of flesh and blood. He never became anything less than what he was. I believe when the Bible says we're created in the likeness and image of God, your spirit, soul, and body. The spirit's part God lives in. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. The body is your five senses. This, this suit that we wear with its senses. We're created, but when we fell, we were reduced to mind, will, and emotion and to this physical body. The Spirit of God died, that part of us in us. We were told, if you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. So we're below. We're, we're not God. The, the psalmist declared that, that man is below the angels. And so man in his fallen state is not in the likeness and the image of God. Were we originally created in his image and his likeness? Yes, the Bible declares that. Are we God? Absolutely not. And anyone who would tell you are of God, that's a false God. There's one God. Hear, O Israel, the Shema. The Lord your God is one. There's one true and living God. You shall love that God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And anything that I would say or profess that would diminish his deity, his absolute authority, is blasphemy. There's this fancy theological word called the hypostatic union. What that simply means is that Jesus was fully man and that he was fully God. The importance of that is that if he wasn't fully God, then he could not have paid the price for the atonement for sin. God needed a perfect sacrifice. Only God is perfect. As far as Jesus is concerned, if he wasn't fully man, how could he die for the sins of mankind? See, animals could not die for our sin. It had to be a man, but that man had to be perfect. So for us to try to liken ourselves to being little gods here, and everything that that would imply, just shows the error of thinking that Jesus somehow divested himself of his glory. It's unbiblical. Whether it's Creflo Dollar, or whether it's Kenneth Copeland, or any of the other ones who believe this, we wouldn't confuse these people with Eastern mystics. These are people who claim the name of Jesus. They talk about Jesus. They read from the Bible. They claim to be Christians. And yet they're teaching a theology that is so unbiblical to think that somehow we are divine here on earth. 
that there is this divinity in us, that we would have the gall to refer to ourselves as little gods, even if we put the small g by it. The charismatic Pentecostals, who are known by many different names, among them <coughs> third wave, latter rain, manifested sons of God, new apostolic reformation, the hyper